happy with his that, but uh, it does this, this talk kind of builds up. So it starts off with some basic knowledge and perhaps some things that are oversimplified, and then I try to build it up. So we've got a cross going on. Um, so the, the title of this was, was quite a difficult thing to pick. Um, calling it deep dive is really an attempt to, to illustrate that, but this isn't comprehensive. I'm not going to teach you everything about classes. Um, this is really some interesting stuff that I discovered when I started to sort of reverse engineer what's going on in such classes and actually trying to look at how they work. And why some of the things I've tried, the, the, what seemed the straightforward way uh, when I first started working with Python didn't work. There were some things that I discovered. I've been working with Python for 11 years now. And, and I wanted, I suddenly realized there were some of these things I wanted to do. And I still wasn't sure that didn't work. So, so I decided to go and have a look. Um, this actually makes it all a bit much more comprehensive than it is. Um, I'm going to start talking about some abstract stuff and thinking about objects, um, how we can think of objects, possibly taking a step back and making the implementation even more conceptually. Then we're going to kind of what makes up an object, how they work within Python, and then again demonstrate the kind of things that you can do once you understand how these things work in general. Um, Although I discovered a lot of this by trial and error, um, when I came to put the slides together and Googling certain terms to make sure that I fully understood how they worked, uh, I found a lot of it is already documented in the standard type of documentation. So it's just worth saying that this, this is more there for you. I had to edit it up, but I said that I could just Very, very upset. <laughs> So, looking at a high level, what is an object? I mean, it's, it's, it's essentially a philosophy of this programming. Um, and it, it starts around the abstract idea. An object is a thing that accomplishes behavior. So, we tend to think, as Python developers, I think, more towards the bottom of this list. It's, it's a bundle of functions and data. And if data and functions operate on that data, do we have to call methods? I wish I knew why we call the methods. Um, but gradually, as you go from the abstract, it's a thing that you can operate on. You start to say, well, it also has to store state. Uh, because when we're really trying to encapsulate something from the real world, usually that's really where the word object comes from. It's a, it's a thing. Um, and so we have to have state, and then we have to have things we can do with it. We have to go to drive the car. We have to turn the It's all those standard examples where we're trying to get across this, this abstract idea to be very nice. Um, but actually, the dictionary of stuff isn't entirely accurate in all languages. So, um, Raymond was, was listing awesome things on Monday. I'm going to show you one of the awesome things he's listed. I'm going to show you some Perl. I, I no longer write Perl, uh, which I'm quite pleased about, to be honest. Um, but, uh, but at one point I was a Perl program, I'm quite mistaken from Perl, this is why I love Python so much. But Perl can do some things that, that Python can't quite do, and that's to separate the representation of the data from behavior. Um, so this is perhaps quite a technical start that you should see, which maybe if you're not that interested in and don't know, um, and, and working on a concept that Python doesn't deal with. But I just wanted to take a step back from thinking about the dictionaries and functions and data. So what this is doing, the first half of this, this code, we're actually finding a package called A. Packages and classes in, in Perl are synonymous, they're the same thing. Um, so what, what it really is is a namespace. It's a namespace, and in here we can find a function called method. It takes a single parameter that's and I just self. Uh, so what we call this is going to have the instance. So in, in Python, it's essentially a dictionary. We can see it's a dictionary. Um, so in this, in this case, we're going to get something else. So I'll show you what we're actually going to get the second part, um, which in a way this would normally be defined in a function. This is our constructor for the object A. So what we've done here, there's a variable called $A. Uh, that's an integer or a scale in, in Perl because it's another type of language. We set it to 12. The line beneath that, we're dereferencing it. So Perl has a point of pointers, effectively. Um, so now we have a reference to an integer. And then the third line, well, we turn it into an object. We bless it, which basically associates our pointer with the package above, which means we can do the thing that we've done on the last line, which is to call the method that we can find in the package. And it does the same thing as Python, which is that it passes the instance into the first parameter. So when we then shift the first parameter, it's another horrible Perlism, 
shift the first parameter off the uh, parameter list. Uh, <coughs> so I can still be called dollar cell, so I can pretend that it's baby if I want. And then we print it out. This actually prints out I am 12. Where it's actually a pointer that you don't know, have to be referenced here. It's a double dollar thing. Um, so why would you want to turn a number into an object? It has no attributes because it's a number. You, you can't look into it. It's got no dictionary of properties. It's just a number 12. There's actually a reasonable practical purpose. This, this, um, this example actually comes from an advanced developer over in the right book. And this is what you do. So normally, uh, they do the same thing as in Carl Tweed. They turn a dictionary into an object so that they can store as much stuff as they want in it and it's feature proof. Um, but dictionaries are very expensive. If you're creating millions of objects, uh, you really don't want to be creating millions of dictionaries. Now, we, we have our own approach to that, and I'll be covering that later. Um, but the Perl approach is to take the data outside the object. So what you do is you create a list for every property, and you pre-allocate it to, say, a million items. Um, in this case, the object has two properties. You've got a name property and an age property. So when you, when you start up your program, when you create your first instance, you, you say, give me a list of a million names. It's empty. Um, and then when you initialize your int, you start at zero, and you keep going up, and then your, your get name function will go to the names list and use self, which is your only state, as the index into the list. So it gives you, so some people separate the state, so you just sort outside and have a tiny, tiny representation for the actual object there to the minimum necessary, just to just the index into the list. Um, so I, I don't really know why I demonstrated that. I think I just wanted to, wanted to put my first um, technical slide up and put that by the problem to the uh, it gives you an idea of, of what you can do when you find when you, when you take your, your eyes off the So Python, to get back to Python, Python is a class-based language, uh, class-based or regional language. Um, we thought about what an object is, how we can consider an object a little bit. Um, I consider a class in Python to be two things. It's a set of instructions, a set effectively a constructor. Um, for creating objects with shared characteristics. So it's where we're creating a new thing. Uh, and it's also a resource shared by those objects. So once you've got an instance, they all have reference to the class of the gate and the subclasses. Um, um, in other languages, they provide other things. So classes provide contracts. Uh, they say this will have this method. Um, and you can get the ability to. Uh, restrict parameters that pass the month. We don't have that, we have duck typing, so in fact the class is less important in Python, I would say, than in standard type languages. Uh, but then we have more power that goes with it. Uh, so when you create an instance, um, it's perhaps a little bit more complicated than this, but at a high level, um, it's created by a new function, as long as called new. Um, that's actually the constructor, so that's the function that's called that's actually responsible for creating a new instance. If you override it, uh, so normally it delegates to the type constructor, but if you override it, you can return anything you want. So I, I could return objects of a different type, um, essentially, uh, but the general use better of creating a factory function um, that's actually outside the class. Um, I think it would be misleading to instantiate an object and make something about it. But I have seen it from time to time where I say drugs. Um, then, once, once it's instantiated, the init method is called, so it's not, it's not so constructed. We tend to call it constructed, but it's actually an initialized the object has already been constructed. We already have places to put our data. Um, so then we have our kind of loop the arrows. You do stuff with the object while it exists in memory, and then at some point, we'll probably go out to scope, um, or we will explicitly call L, uh, and then if you've defined it, double underscore del function, we call it T, not anything. Um, so if you've got names of resources, sometimes you can hide sort of thing um, from the other and then the outside of the Oh, so. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so the, the, the bit in italics here where it says it's called by the garbage collector, not by the Dell operator, is not quite correct. I went to the talk this morning on my fire and debugging, and I found that in fact you can rely on C Python on the objects uh, called Dell immediately, as soon as you deallocate it, um, unless it's in some 
But, but you shouldn't rely on Dell being called at the same time as you call Dell. It's actually called when the memory is uh, just before the memory is So don't want to store Dell. Uh, if you define it, you've got to make sure that your objects don't end up in a circular reference. So all, all you need is a circular reference where any one of those objects implements Dell and none of those objects will be, uh, ever be garbage collected. Uh, you need to break them up manually, uh, and because only you know how. If you, did, if you uh, had two objects that relied on references being valid, uh, one of them had been cleaned up so those references don't like the objects that refer to no longer in memory, then, uh, then you're going to end up in trouble. It's, it's actually a problem that's unsolved, which is why it doesn't solve it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's worth noting that what if you have a runtime that's gradually building up uh, objects in memory, uh, if you call GC collect to clean up any <coughs> objects that can be cleaned up, then gc.garbage is a list of all the objects that can be collected. So if at any point in the execution of your program, that list has stuff in it, then you're probably in trouble unless you have some custom codes to clean up, um, clean up these uh, cycle references. I think most of us are quite uh, confident that, in fact, it's quite hard to create cycle reference. Um, but I've encountered it twice in the last year, and they've both been effectively this. This is a node in a tree, and it refers to both parents and to children. So it refers to its parent, and its parent refers to it. Um, and in this case, this is a stupid example of something you do in the middle of the But if, if there was a native object that talks to this, um, you might well want to have a Dell. Um, what you just created is this, which is a whole tree of cyclical references. So that's a tree, usually a big data structure. So we still suffer from memory leaks in Python. We are just in a different place. Um, so we just have to be a bit careful about these caveats from the language. So we've talked about uh, the life cycle of an object. We're going to talk about attribute storage now. Um, so we have two methods of attribute storage in Python. We have uh, the default method, which I've discussed, which is to store the attributes uh, in a dictionary. Um, and then we have slots, uh, which is the you name of yourself. Uh, so, yes, so uh, normally you have this double underscore dict property in uh, an object, you don't define it, but it's there. Um, and when you request an attribute using the dot operator, um, that's where it is where it done. Uh, if you have lots and lots and lots of an instance of an object and they all have the same kind of structure, you're not planning to dynamically add attributes to them. Um, if you add this slots attribute, um, you will get a more memory efficient but restrictive object. And I'll go into that in a So here's just a quick example of a, an object that uses a one for dip. So as I say, you don't need to define it, so it's already there. I've created a, a person class. People tend to have four limbs. Uh, and then in the constructor, I've created an instance variable called name, and I've added on a method called speak. So we can actually refer to the double underscore dit, and you see that the only thing in there is the instance attribute that we've added, so name is not. Um, if we want the other things, we have to look at the person with double underscore dit. So that actually hands us back a bit to proxy object. I think the proxy object is uh, a read only list. Um, and that's simply to stop people from updating the bit themselves and uh, essentially providing more attributes to an object that C Python isn't aware of. So the bit proxy says it's got you from kind of knocking around without going to the right mechanisms. Um, so just passing uh, the bit proxy to the bit constructor, um, we actually get a dictionary. Uh, and you'll see that there is limbs and there is our function speak. I have to be quite careful about terminology when talking about functions and methods. What you get in the dictionary is a function. Again, that's something I'll be covering slightly later in the talk. So, the alternative method is slots. So, here I've created a person, and I've just defined these two slots. They're not quite the same object, but it's similar. Um, uh, it's a list of strings. Each of these is an attribute that we are, will be allowed to store on instances of this class. So, you see below, I instantiate it, and then I set the values of name and age, and that's fine because name and age are both in our slots um, list. Uh, and then I attempted to set a telephone number, and that's that's where it's an attribute there. Um, it's uh, because, because tell isn't in the slots list. You're only allowed to store attributes that are in that list. Um, 
it's worth memorizing this exception string for personal object has no attribute tell because it's true it doesn't have an attribute tell but it didn't have slots that would be fine because you're assigning an attribute to the objects so you'd be reading that but Python doesn't care right now attributes because that's it, it, it's a problem I had before it's it's slightly frustrating but. Um, so just to actually get into some of the detail about slots, I realized the last time I talked about slots um, with people I didn't really know the benefit was I had a vague idea it was faster and I had a vague idea that it used less memory. Um, so I did a quick test and I created a million objects with 16 attributes each. Um, and you find that about a 10% improvement is not huge. Speed is probably not the reason that you use slots. Um, the reason you use slots is this, uh, which is memory usage for the same objects. Um, either with or without slots. Uh, if you use slots, it, it takes about a sixth of the amount of memory um, as, as if you don't. There's just a more efficient form of, of storing data. If you have lots and lots of objects with the same structure, so if you're thinking of tabular structure, for example, where essentially each object is a, is a row and they all tend to have the same columns, it's, it's worth thinking about using slots as an optimization. So this this is where I was kind of expecting people to say their hands up and say, well, that's not quite right, there's lots of stuff going on. But, so this is a simplified version of what happens when you ask for an attribute using the dot operator. The first thing is it looks at the instance. Um, I should point out that this talk is designed as a scale, so it gradually goes up in complexity. I'm pretty certain most people know this, at least um, subconsciously. So we look at the instance, we look in the class, and then if it's not in either of those places, we go up to subclass um, chain in the resolution order, which used to be really easy to describe for new star classes, but it's now a bit more complicated, so I won't try to explain it. Um, and then if you can't find it anywhere and you've reached the object um, class at the top, it's not there, phrase an attribute here. So just an example of that uh, is a classic phone inheritance problem. So you have to demonstrate when you're working with a language that, that has uh, multiple um, and that's the code. I trace each of these classes. Top extends object because it's a new style class in Python 2. Um, left extends top, right extends top, and bottom extends both left and right. You can obtain the method resolution order, so if you ever have a question about exactly where you're getting things from, you can get this from using the double underscore MRO attributes. Um, I personally think that method resolution order is not quite the right name for it because it applies to all attributes. So if you obtain an attribute on an instance, it's going to go through this. It doesn't matter whether it's a method or not, it's, it's going to go through this logic. Um, so here you can see it goes bottom and then it goes up to the left because that was the first one the bottom inherited from. Um, and then it goes up to the right so it does, it goes across. And then it goes up to the top, which are both share, and then object, which is the object that, that we didn't have in the dialogue. So just to demonstrate, but this actually confused me for a while. I didn't quite understand in Python the difference between class and instance variables, so I thought it was worth just demonstrating. I created an instance of bottom, um, and then printed out the, the me attribute, um, and then I just overshadowed it. So when you set my bottom me, you're not actually replacing the value you've just printed out. It's slightly confusing in your Python programmers. Um, it, instead, you're, you're creating a new attribute on the instance rather than the class. It just, it just means that if you then put bottom button me, it's still the old value, it's still there. Um, but if you then delete the instance that you just, just had, um, then uh, you still have a value. It's kind of confusing. I've just deleted the, the me attribute, but it's like the little element of that, and it's still there. It's a uh, slight attribute. And then I just go out the tree. I've deleted the one in the bottom class. And then when I print it out, I get left. When I delete the one in left, I get right. When I delete the one in right, I get top. And then when I delete the one in top, I get an attribute error, as you'd expect, because there is the attribute is no longer quite like anywhere in the hierarchy. Um, so that's inheritance. Um, but as I've actually heard this mentioned as an overview of couple of times, which I can't let into getting into it. Um, inheritance is no longer quite that simple. Python. So since the abstract base class uh, package was added to Python, we could now um, mess about a little bit with um, whether the, um, object, the class is an instance or a subclass of another class. So here I've de uh, defined a superclass dependency. So the, the way this works is it will always, if you call this subclass, you test against the 
yes, this everything will return true. Um, and the two components to this are meta class, you have to extend the meta class ABC meta, um, and then you define this class method called subclass hook, which takes the class that you're testing, um, the, sorry, the, the um, class that, that is being called on, uh, which is in this case the subclass of the superclass of everything, and then, then the subclass that you're testing against. In this case, it just returns true. Um, and this hook is called by a subclass. So I'm saying is tuple a subclass of subclass of everything, and I get true, even though tuple is quite obviously not a subclass of, of this class. This class didn't exist, but tuple is defined class, defined for the four at this point. And the same with string. So I mean that's obviously an abuse of subclass of everything. Uh, a lot of sorry, uh, of um, subclass hook. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of uh, good coding examples in here. This is mostly mucking around with the examples of Python. Um, this is actually what it's for. So this is, this is why it's implemented. Uh, so, um, so I've implemented an iterable here. This is called free forever. Um, it's both an iterable and an iterator because it returns itself when you call log on the iter. Um, and it also implements the next functions. So this is just going to keep on returning three. You'd be much better off using it as a solicitor. But it gives you an example. You'll notice it, it extends object. So it doesn't extend iterable. In other languages, you would extend iterable. Um, and probably iterator as well. Um, but we don't have that philosophy in Python. We implement protocols generally rather than extending classes of follow up contracts that way. Um, so here, you can test against the collections. So the collections is a bunch of abstract base classes and it includes the iterable and iterated base classes. So this is now um, a way of uh, being able to test whether something conceptually is one of these things. It's no longer really strict type inheritance. You're already asking a question which, which you could have used to answer with a very, a very um, strict function, which is is iter, and, and that's what is iterable. That's, that's not the um, but this is, this is a scalable way of doing that. It's worth noting while we're talking about subclasses and what is a subclass or something else, that the classes are always considered to be a subclass of themselves. I don't know whether that's useful for anybody, but it might be useful shorthand. But that's, of course, if you don't create, if, if you don't um, implement subclass that can return false, that would be the only case where a <laughs> class wouldn't be a subclass in itself. Um, and also this instance hook. So this works more or less in the same way, except that it, it mucks around with the behavior of his instance rather than his subclass. Um, so I've covered attributes and, and inheritance. Um, and I'm going to continue talking about attributes and the way they behave, because we're about to talk about methods, and the two are quite tightly bound, mainly because the method is an attribute. Um, again, it's something that confuses newer. Python programmers is they don't come in from other languages, they're, they're not encouraged to think of this as an operator. It's, you know, the biggest functions in many languages aren't first class, um, first class properties, so you can't assign it to variables and things. But in this case, um, we all know that if you go through the braces at the end, that, that will return a variable that you can then pass around and do useful things with. Um, but in this case, when you call a method, you're doing two things. You're obtaining the method and then you're calling it. Uh, I'm going to be referring to that quite a bit. Slides. Uh, so here is an object. Um, I've spent the last couple of days trying to remove all the classes called A from this presentation. It makes it extremely confusing that you're redefining the same class and it's got the same name as the variable. That would be quite a lot of So this is A, and it implements my method. We're going to be looking at this for the next few slides, uh, despite it might be very interesting. And I've created an instance of it also called A. Um, and then we can get this function, um, or the method. Is it still working? Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. Can you still hear me in the back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, OK, so we can get this in three different ways. We can get three different objects. Uh, this was really what kicked off this whole research project of mine, was that when you refer to the bit directly, and just ask for it by name, you get a function. So I know the functions. I've worked with functions before. And they usually talk about the things. So what yeah, has this function doing in my, in my object? Uh, and then, then when you refer to it, when you obtain it using get actual, um, it, or the, the operator, um, 
you can get the number. So I'm kind of used to that. I've seen that before and used it a couple of times. Used to refer to, to refer to the superpass at some point. And then, of course, when I uh, say for instance, I get bound method. So the bound method is special. I don't have to pass in such. But again, it's something that confuses people. You have to find the method for itself as its first parameter. You don't have to pass it in. It's, it's kind of much more but uh, I'm starting to understand why. Um, and here we do the same thing, we're so calling them now. So we're going one step further. This is the second operator in sequence, and I'm calling them however I have to. So the first line here, I'm obtaining my function, and I'm calling it and passing in the instance. So that's the normal method, effectively, it's just slightly weird syntax for it. Um, the interesting thing is it's not quite the same as a method call. Because the methods have validation beforehand to check for itself. It's actually an instance of the class that that function belongs to. Um, and we don't have that. We're getting a function, not an unbound method. So I can call that method with a string instead of an instance of A. Really don't recommend you do that. Uh, that's more or less breaking every, every contract that, that, that you have with the uh, method. Uh, but it does show you can do it. And if you, did, if you believe in monkey patching and that kind of thing, you, you can take a method and call it whatever you like yourself. Um, so, um, so then, we're, like, doing the normal method call, I'm like, sorry, I shuffled the order a little bit here. Doing method call in the instance, they don't have to pass an instance. This time, it already has a reference to the instance. I'm going to show you how that works in a bit. Um, and then the last example, um, we're just obtaining the method directly on the class. And again, because it's not a bound method, it doesn't know what self is. You have to pass in the instance for it to um, So, yeah, we've already said this. The instances don't contain methods. Classes don't contain methods. Um, and because we've only defined a method and no attributes on this, uh, on this, uh, in, in this class, because it's more of an instance, I should say, so you don't have to. Um, so, yeah, the bound methods are provided on access. Because we don't need a different thing here when we, when we ask for it in a different way. So, the, the dot operator is actually doing something because we know that they're stored in the class, so we know that this, according to our logic, should so this should fall through and contain it from the class, but it doesn't because it, it, it does an unbound method and not bound method. So it's a different thing when you request it from the class. So it must be executing code somewhere. Um, so I'm looking for it. Um, <coughs> there are three ways that I could look for exactly what happens. Three ways that I know to call uh, to actually execute code when it looks like you're accessing an attribute. And um, these are the ones that I know. So there's get attribute, which executes when you ask for an attribute that isn't defined on an instance or a class. There's get attributes, um, which actually implements the logic for, for obtaining an attribute. Uh, and that's the first thing it's called. Uh, or there's a descriptive protocol, which some people have heard of. And so just adding some more stuff to our previous simplified cascade logic. The first thing that happens is it calls get attribute, and then the rest of this stuff happens. So it looks to see if the attribute is in the instance, um, or if it's not, if it's in the class. And because of the descriptive protocol, if it does find it on the class, it has to be on the class. Um, it checks to see whether it's a descriptor and it does something with it. Um, if it's not descriptive, or if it's not there, it then checks the superclasses. And again, it will keep repeating the free 3.1 thing if it finds it. Um, and then, if it gets to the top, we normally we just raise an attribute error, that's of course gets attributes, so you have to do it if it maybe gets infected or something like that. Like a virtual attribute, if you like. Uh, and then in the back one, where that raises an attribute error, then they can fail. Um, so yeah, this I've kind of already said this gets attributes and gets attributes. There are different ends in the, the, the logic list to get an attribute. Um, gets attributes. Um, but the one that I've highlighted in bold up here in sort of little white 
dog on the school get that in in case you need this is the descriptor. So it's time to talk about the descriptor protocol. Um, the descriptor protocol, among other things, states that if you access an attribute of and it's found on the class and it implements a double underscore get method, then that method will be called and the result of that will be returned instead of the attribute itself. So it's our third way of executing code on attribute access. So we can do that one. Um, there's some other stuff which I'll, I'll cover briefly. Um, but effectively, this is our property. So we can call that property a call function in the background. I'm going to show you how that works in a minute. Um, but just to kind of finish off our understanding of kind of how our methods get generated. Uh, and I hope not too many of you went to the last quite the last quite of the course course yesterday because I think I might have been quite happy with that. So it's good. So it's good. Um the uh, the the uh, so yes, uh, in this case our method influence double underscore get. So when you access it on the class um, or via the internet, it calls this double underscore get. Method. If you're accessing it on the class rather than the instance, uh, the instance is set to none, uh, but the same method will be called. And we can test this. Um, and here it is. So I'll define the person uh, with a get name method. And just at the top, for convenience later on, I instantiate the person uh, and call it who, uh, if it's not my name. And I go reference to the function. So I call the function directly out of the class. I'm not talking about non back or about the head so if I just print it, I get the function, get name. Um, then if I call that underscore get manually, so this is what's being done behind the scenes by Python when you access um, capital person, oh sorry, person dot um, uh, get name. Uh, with none and the person being in the class that you're supposed to be calling it on, um, it's you get an unbound method. And then when you call it with the instance as the first round, you get a bound method. So this is actually our solution for how Python creates um, methods. And I think, I think the best way to demonstrate what it's kind of doing in terms is actually to look at something slightly different and look at the property. So this is how we use property. I think everybody here has probably used the property decorated before. Um, so I've instantiated my B and then I keep referring to value, but each time the value changes, even though I have the control of the code. Um, I, I'm just, just supposed to be accessing something. So what it's done is it's replaced value with another thing that implements the descriptive protocol. So instead of returning value, which is a function each time, it calls value and returns the result. And we can simulate that with this. It's slightly more complicated. So we've got an object that implements the descriptive protocol. And when it's instantiated, because it's, this is effectively a, a, a decorator, even though it's an object, um, we just store away the function that's passed into the constructor. Um, and then when somebody accesses uh, ourselves, ourselves, we, we, call, um, we, we call the target function concealed away and pass in the instance. So this is ourself that we've got here, which is passed in as the first parameter to the double underscore get. Um, that would be enough on its own, we could just use that as a decorator. But I don't, people don't expect decorators to be classes, so I define the decorator as a separate factory. <coughs> you call the function over and turn it on the factory. But yeah, so I've called it property 2, um, and it takes a function and returns the thing to replace the function, which is, which is how it gets up there. And then just to test that that works, um, I've created a class called test property. It sets its initial value to 0. And then, oh, this is effectively the same thing as we saw before, except that it says property 2 instead of property. Um, and then we loop it through and keep accessing the next ID. And when this runs, we get 154 by 6789. And that's how simple implementing something that conceptually is quite difficult to do uh, is when you have this powerful tool in the background like this. Okay, sorry. Um, but there's actually these other two 
methods that will also intercept um, what, what don't, things that don't look like function calls, but will become function calls. So we've got set that, that is, uh, is executed when we attempt to modify the attribute um, that, that is an instance of this object. And you've got double underscore del, which is um, executed when we attempt to delete the attributes from, from the class. So just to finish off, um, I don't like this is quite theoretical talk, and I don't really like to be fully theoretical talks. I like to practical examples, things that, that you can do and sort of improve your code on a daily basis, but I couldn't. So instead, we have a couple of slides sheet that I can dress. It's not quite as, uh, as good as, as it was when I originally put this together, because like, the, the third one was um, was calling a method with uh, uh, a self of a different type. These are vaguely sensible, and I suppose could be useful to somebody. But if you're trying to do this kind of thing, I think you probably have to ask yourself why you're trying to do it, whether there's a better, better way to do it. Um, so, tacking on the class method. These were the kinds of things I was trying to do in my early days of performing sort of confidence in Python, and the things that didn't really tend to work that well. So, in this case, I um, created a class called empty, created a function at the top level called add on method. Which isn't a method, it's a function. Uh, and then I've just set that on the class. And that's fine, that, that works absolutely fine. You'll notice that the first parameter is self, so it has access to the instance when it's called. Um, it really does behave in every way like a uh, method that was defined, you know, it could have defined two levels earlier if it's identified by one. Um, so this one sucks, that's useful if you want to modify a class of one type based on something. Uh, I suspect you could have done that for one reason or another. Um, uh, but this was what I was really trying to do, was tackle an instance method. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. You do actually need to understand what's going on. This one is relatively easy. This is a static method. The static methods don't have access to the, uh, the data that's stored within the instance. Um, so here we've got another, the same empty class, and then we've got a very similar add-on function, except this one doesn't take self as a first parameter. Um, and then we instantiate it, and then we tack on the, the function to our, uh, to our instance. And then we call it with no parameters, and that's fine, but because it doesn't have access to self, it's really you're just namespacing the function under, under the instance. It's, it's not really connected. Um, you need a little bit more code if you actually want to tack on methods to instances. So, I don't really know why you'd want to do this. I think you want to start having a look at meta classes or class factories is, is probably the correct way to do it. But if you did have a system that had hundreds of little objects that were all had slightly different behavior defined by something else and none of them you were never going to get the same behavior in the two objects, maybe this is a vaguely reasonable solution. But this is how you implement dynamic instances so you can tap on methods that have a, uh, access to state. We need somewhere to store those methods because we're talking of working, we're working outside the standard um, the, uh, class system in Python now. So we need somewhere to store them. We create a dictionary for all my methods, um, and then we create this, this slightly monstrous get after um, implementation. So what, the, what it's really doing, relatively straightforward, is looking to see if there is a method with that name in the right methods list, um, and if there is, then it wraps it and returns the wrapper. So this is, this is our bound method, if you like, which is why I call the function bound method. It will return that. Um, if it's not in my methods, it will return an attribute error, which is what you can start when you try to do something that wasn't there. Now, the implementation of bound method, um, we, we first call out the method um, into a variable just to make it a bit more readable. Um, and then we execute it with all the arguments that were provided. So we've now gone to uh, this point, because we've skipped around in the actual order of execution here. This is the end of the actual access um, when we return to this bound, bound method. And then it gets executed by braces, and that's the point where we're executing this, where it actually looks like a method. Because it's a closure, it has access to self. So we can call it with self as the first parameter, and the arguments that were passed. That's, that behaves like a net. You can actually show how this works. It's a bit of a time slice monster, uh, but it does work. So we've defined a top level function, we've created an instance of malleable, or perhaps subclass, or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and then we take our instance, we, we just 
tap in this method on the good and then the our function on the good and then we like, and then we call um, B, and the next piece uh, has access to the state of the normal method we have. Um, still not entirely certain why we want to do that, but that's what I wanted to do a couple of years ago and, and couldn't get access to so. itself. What we've really done there, what we've really done in this case actually is to the case and modify the actual function that's available on Python when you access the method. Except now we're, actually, we're working on an instance rather than the class. Uh, so those are my two stupid questions. Any question? I have one. Have you discovered a way to add the um, special methods on instances uh, one time? No. I haven't tried, and I suspect that they rely on some of the other ideas. Like optimization or something like that. Okay. Well, I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> Which is that um, 
Oh, when you're instantiating the class, you when you're initializing an element of the class, you might actually want to call the super class. And there's a SQL method that is designed specifically for that, that uses the MRO to sort out what's going on. So you don't have to say, oh, I'm a wibble and my parents are wobbles, so I'm going to call wobbles method. It doesn't simply say call the super classes method. And it's a cooperative super class structure. It's a little bit advanced, but it supports that. If you um, if you try and shove all the methods onto one class, then there's no super class to have methods to call them on. Yeah, it would be inside the caching problem, really, isn't it? You might get some benefits at the bottom of the text. Anybody else? Yeah. From the back. <laughs> Is it uh, correct that uh, by using using the slots, you actually make Python uh, seem like the beautiful uh, Perl uh, example at, at start, where you have uh, the data stored away from from uh, the instance? I, I guess so. Uh, to me, it seems like a much more elegant solution than having to manually define data structures to hold or what should be on the so by using slots, we turn uh, Python into Perl. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Anybody else? There's still room for one for one question. No. Okay. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>